All right, folks, welcome back to Chapter 5, Integumentary System. This is 5-3 to 5-5. We almost finished the epidermis. We talked about the layers and the four layers and thin skin and the five layers and thick skin, but something we didn't do about the epidermis, and that's vitamin D synthesis, or actually the beginning of vitamin D synthesis. So we're going to do that, and then we're going to switch over to the dermis and talk about the dermis. It's a connective tissue. And we'll, we'll get into that. So let's start with this vitamin D synthesis. All right, so first of all, the vitamin D synthesis requires three major steps. The first step occurs in the skin. The second step occurs in the liver. And the third step occurs in the kidneys. What happens is, well, let me give you an overview. Vitamin D3 is necessary for calcium absorption. And if you don't absorb calcium, of course, your bones get weak. And so insufficient vitamin D is a disease called rickets. And these legs are the legs of a person with rickets. What happens is the bones lose mineral but not protein. So they're mainly a collagenous structure. And they're flexible. So they bend outward, as you can see here. And that's that's typical of rickets right there. The uh, vitamin D3 synthesis begins in the skin when UV radiation hits the skin. And here's what happens. Sunlight hits a steroid compound. Remember that steroid compounds are that are that uh, cyclopentanophenanthrene ring. That's what it's called. They're all they all have that cyclopentanophenanthrene. And when sunlight hits your skin, that steroid compound becomes cholecalciferol. Now that's the beginning of vitamin D, and that's not active vitamin D. That flows through your blood and hits your liver. And in your liver, it encounters an enzyme called 25-hydroxylase. And what 25-hydroxylase does is exactly what it sounds like. It adds, an, it adds a hydroxyl group, an OH, to the 25th carbon. So now I've hydroxylated my cholecalciferol, and in fact, I'm called 25-hydroxy. I was going to abbreviate. I better not. I better not abbreviate 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol and that's not even active vitamin D that compound 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol goes to the kidneys and it encounters another enzyme called 1 alpha hydroxylase and what the 1 alpha hydroxylase does is exactly what it sounds it adds a hydroxyl group to the 1 alpha position and now what I have is 1 alpha 25 dihydroxy because of the 1 alpha hydroxyl group and the 25 hydroxyl group dihydroxy cholecalciferol that is active vitamin D this is the active form this is what we want this is what goes to the intestines and says reabsorb all the calcium that this guy just drank assuming you drank it in milk versus maybe you ate it in cheese or something like that. So this 1-alpha-25-dihydroxycholecalciferol is active vitamin D. Now it has another name. Its other name is calcitriol because what I want you to realize is we've added two hydroxy groups at the 1-alpha position and the 25 position. But when anything ends in OL, it is what we call an alcohol. And an alcohol group is the same thing as a hydroxy group. It's an OH. So cholecalciferol already has an OH. And I've added two other OHs at the 1 alpha and the 25 position. So I'm actually a triol. I have three of these OH groups. So we call this 1 alpha 25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol calcitriol. And that's active vitamin D. Now that goes to the intestines and says reabsorb more calcium. The calcium goes into your blood. It actually turns right around on the kidneys and says, don't urinate out calcium. The calcium is reabsorbed into my blood, and there's less calcium in your urine. So vitamin D3 increases blood calcium, in other words. And by increasing blood calcium, it's added to my bones. I got strong bones. Without vitamin D3, I get rickets. All right, so the skin is important with that. Now, this is not for you to commit to memory. Absolutely not. Your, uh, there is an epidermal growth factor. It's a factor that does exactly what it sounds like. It tells the stratum germinativum to grow. 
And please do not memorize this whole story right here. So why do I show it to you? Because what I want you to realize is that this whole signal transduction pathway, the epidermal growth factor stays outside the cell, but somehow it sends a signal down into the DNA and says, hey, let's, let's turn on mitosis. Well, how a molecule that never enters the cell sends that signal down through the cell is called signal transduction. And I want you to realize that there's graduate classes called signal transduction. So you have one whole class on just what you're looking at right here. And you're saying, well, how could you possibly cover this in 15, or why would you take require 15 weeks to cover this? You might be saying that. Or you actually might be saying, how could you possibly cover all this in 15 weeks, depending on your viewpoint. Signal transduction is a very complicated pathway. And uh, some of these RAS proteins, and there's some RAF protein. Yeah, here's a RAF. I was going to say you couldn't see it there, but there it is. These are involved in cancer. So no, I don't want you to memorize this signal transduction pathway. I want you to realize that signal transduction is very complicated. And I want you to realize that you could have cancer and not have excess growth factors. You could have cancer and have excess growth factors, but you could have cancer and your growth factors are normal. Well, how could that be? Well, you could have a bad receptor that's always on, regardless of the growth factor presence or absence. So this receptor could always be on. And this receptor is called epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, but there's all kinds of, of growth hormones and growth factors out there, and there's all kinds of receptors out there, and they could always be on because there's something wrong with them. And if you remember back to chapter two, I talked about to have cancer, you need two things to occur. You need to press the gas of mitosis, and you have to remove the brakes of mitosis. Just one of these mutations doesn't give you cancer. Pressing the gas is like increasing growth factors or having uh, growth factor receptors always be on. Always, they're always on. Removing the brakes is having bad P53 tumor suppressor proteins or other tumor suppressor proteins. P53, by the way, is a real famous one. So you could remove the brakes by having either poorly functioning P53 or, or the absence of P53, something like that. So signal transduction is huge, very complicated story. You might run into it in, in uh, some of your upper division, upper level classes, 300, 400 level classes. In, in fact, I'm sure you will. And then if you go to graduate school, there are entire classes on just signal transduction. All right, let's get back to something you do need to know. Let's get to the dermis. The dermis is the thickest area of the skin. This is the dermis from here to here. Uh, remember, be careful, because when I talked about the epidermis, I said the stratum corneum was the thickest area of the epidermis. And that's true, but the dermis is the thickest area of the skin. So when you when you uh, sit there and memorize these layers of the epidermis, stratum germinativum, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, stratum corneum, when you memorize those, that's going to be fine, but realize that the epidermis is, is one of two major layers of the skin. Why do I say one of two? Because remember, this hypodermis down here is not really skin. It's really superficial fascia, but we always study it in the skin chapter, and we will again. So the dermis is the thickest layer of the skin. It has two sublayers, the papillary layer right here, which is areolar connective tissue. You must memorize that. Papillary layer is areolar or connective tissue. If you don't remember what subcategory that is, it's connective tissue proper and loose connective tissue within that. Areolar is a subcategory of loose connective tissue. And then the reticular layer is a confusing layer because it's not reticular connective tissue. I wish we didn't call it reticular, but we do. It's really dense, irregular connective tissue. It's the same kind of connective tissue that, that makes up capul capsules of our organs and is found in periosteum and perichondrium. And that's what we said back in the tissue chapter. So it's dense, irregular connective tissue. All right, so those are the two layers of the dermis. Notice that all of my blood vessels exist in the dermis. None of these blood vessels go up into the epidermis. Notice that many of my nerve endings are in the dermis. However, 
there are some nerve endings that go up into the epidermis, like these these free nerve endings. Free nerve endings are uh, involved in pain and tickle. Pain and tickle. Probably itch. Yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm sure it's itch. But really not many nerve endings delve into the epidermis. Most of them stay down here in the dermis. Like you can see that Meissner's corpuscles. And uh, I wish there was a Merkel's disc here to show you. But I, uh, hopefully in a few minutes I'll have a picture of a Merkel's disc and show you that. But that a lot of these nerve endings stay in the dermis. My blood vessels all stay in the dermis. Now something I should point out here. I'm going to talk about thermal regulation of the skin here in a second. I can shut down these capillary beds. I can close off that capillary bed. I can close off that one. I can close off that one, and et cetera, et cetera. I can close these off. I have sphincter muscles that can shut them down. Well, why would I want to do that? Well, if it's January and it's cold outside and I'm, out, and I'm outside, why would I want my warm blood to flow up towards the surface of my skin? It's just going to get cold. Well, I don't. So what I do is I close off these capillary beds and I keep my warm blood um, further from the surface of my skin and I keep it warm whereas on, on the flip side of that coin if I'm in the gym working out you know doing my 2000th push-up or my 50th chin-up or whatever I'm doing I will open these capillary beds and let the blood flow to the surface of my skin so I can irradiate that heat and that's one way of getting rid of heat so my skin is also involved in thermal regulation You can see a lot of the accessory glands and organs are found in my dermis. For example, for example, the sudoriferous gland, that's another word for sweat gland. I'll spell it out for you. Sudoriferous. The sudoriferous glands found in my dermis. My uh, hair follicle, I want you to think of it like this. My hair follicle is like pushing my epidermis down into my dermis. And when we study the hair, you'll see why I want you to think of it that way. My hair follicles down in the, in the dermis. My erector pili muscle, a smooth muscle that's hooked to my hair, that's down in the dermis. My sebaceous gland, my gland that secretes the oily substance called sebum, that's down in my dermis. So I have all these, a lot of these accessory glands and organs are down in my dermis. And here's a, a scanning electron micrograph of the dermis. Uh, the it's dense irregular connective tissue, so the fibers don't run in perfect parallel rows. They're a little bit irregular, as you can see. They're 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 irregular here. If you forgot what the three fibers of connective tissue are, they are collagen, reticulin, and elastin. These are the three fibers of of connective tissue. So in dense irregular connective tissue, collagen is the major one, but yes, there are, is reticulin and elastin, which gives it some flexibility. So you can see my fibers of this dense irregular connective tissue. All right, that's it for the... No, it's not it. My dermis, uh, because of the way these fibers run, they create these cleavage lines. Now these are how the fibers are running. They're, now, they're not all perfectly parallel, but in general, these fibers create these parallel lines in my body called cleavage lines. Now, who cares? Well, most people don't care, but surgeons care and surgical nurses care, and here's why. If you make an incision perpendicular to a cleavage line, that incision is going to stay wider, longer, and create a bigger scar, and it's because these this is it's because these cleavage lines are going to pull this incision apart or keep it from sealing well and you'll get a bigger scar whereas if you make an, an incision along parallel to a cleavage line there's nothing pulling this incision apart so it heals very nicely with a very fine scar if any scar at all so surgeons know this and other people that uh, that make incisions and then suture you up so the cleavage lines are important with uh, any kind of surgery, minor or major, for, for keeping your scar at a minimum. And that's it of the dermis. All right, I'll see you in the next section.